Uh, and so uh, I got a little segment I want to do here that uh, is is for the live stream, but also for the live stream clips channel. And it relates to the flight test easy ID module, the remote ID module that I reviewed. And there's a thing that people are say saying in the comments. They take a look at it and they say, a hundred bucks? Why, that's a GPS receiver and a Bluetooth system on chip. Why, I could build one of those for 30 bucks. And they don't realize, like, it's like, it's like the, it's like the, you know, the thousand dollar toilet seat, you know, the government bought the military a thousand dollar or the, or the $800 screwdriver. People don't realize that when government regulation is involved, things get more expensive. And when we're talking about like military contracting, things get more expensive in part just because the military has a huge budget and there's all these ways that contractors inflate their budget. That's not what I'm saying is going on. What I'm saying is going on is that when you have a requirement, a legal, technical, regulatory requirement that you have to meet, it costs money to meet that standard and to to affirm that you meet that standard, right? So if you have a bolt that is made to go on an F-22, there may be no actual difference between that bolt and a different bolt that you get down at the hardware store, except that the entire supply chain of everything that went into making the bolt that goes into the F-22 is documented. And it's been tested and so forth. And there's all this additional bullshit around making sure that it meets the standard. And that costs money. So, for example, uh, there are requirements about the, uh, the, you know, the Bluetooth transmission, the GPS device. There's a tamper resistant requirement. So, like, one of the things people asked is, there's open source code on GitHub right now that will broadcast remote ID. Why did they have to develop their own code? Why did they have to write code from scratch? And the answer is that there's this tamper resistant requirement. And just taking open source code and slapping it on there might not have met that. They had to develop their own closed source compiled code instead. There's a requirement that the device maximize the possible range of the signal while still using off the shelf components. So some work had to be put into choosing a Bluetooth device that would fit that, that vague requirement. Um, There's a lot of work that goes into making sure that this device is going to meet the requirements. The, 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 the remote ID standard, the ASTM standard that defines how a remote ID module must work, doesn't just say, yeah, whatever, just broadcast some shit, you'll be fine. It has all these requirements and work has to go into meeting those requirements and that costs money. So, um, when you look at remote ID modules, and it's not just the flight test module, when you look at remote ID modules and they're all like a hundred bucks, 80 bucks, maybe 60 bucks, it's not because the manufacturers are ripping you off. It's because just slapping a GPS and an uh, ESP32 onto a board and broadcasting an open source remote ID co code isn't going to actually meet the regulatory requirements. So. Okay, just wanted to get that out there. I'm I, just as bugging the shit out of me. Um, I really, I really, and you don't have to agree with me on this, but I really firmly believe that the guys at Flight Test and and FPV Freedom Coalition who worked with them on it did the absolute best they could to make this module as inexpensive as they possibly could. And to see people in the YouTube comments just being like, "Whatever, I could build one for thirty bucks," it's like, "No, you couldn't." You could build a piece of electronics that broadcasts a remote ID signal. You could not design a device that actually would be accepted by the FAA as fitting all their requirements for that price. We, we should also uh, yeah. put the other side of this up, though, is many of the modules submitted likely are not compliant and nobody is checking them. So it doesn't matter to a lot of people. That's the problem here. Right. Well, 
Because like nobody's actually checking. You're filling out your means of compliance. You're submitting that. The FAA is accepting right. that as fact, and then you're right. done. And then that's the month so that's you out say on the market. The, so, so, so for people who don't know, the means of compliance is a set of steps that you assert that you followed that then means you have produced a remote ID module that will fit the standard. And you submit your module to the FAA and you say, oh yeah, I use this means of compliance. Here are the steps I followed. No one checks to see if you actually did it. And the FAA gives you a declaration of compliance, rubber stamps it, and now your module is approved. But the problem with that, correct me if I'm wrong, Blunty, is at some point in the future, the FAA could go, wait a minute, this module doesn't actually meet the standards. Hey! And could withdraw the declaration of compliance, right? Unless the manufacturer can like show that they're actually meeting the standards. Sure. Yep. But what yep. effect does that actually have for any user? Nothing really, right? That's the thing. Well, That's if, where a lot of people if, are coming from. If they withdraw the declaration of compliance, does that mean that retroactively all the modules are no longer legal? Right, but they were up to that point, and you didn't know better as a user, and you may not even get the memo about it. And like, I, I mean, I just understand the other side of the argument, where people are like, well, if a cheap module comes out, they can lie about the DLC all they want. They're a Chinese company. Who cares? I'm going to use it until it's not legal, and the FAA may never give a shit. You know? Like, I understand they've, the other side of the argument. They've covered their ass by buying a module, a cheap module, that may not turn out to stand up to scrutiny. But since it's the manufacturer who's going to get hosed, they'll probably get a, they'll probably get a pass. If, it, if they right. have any remote ID module at all, the FAA probably won't be like, hey, you should have known. They'll probably be there's okay. There's no way you could have known. Yeah, there's no way you could have known because you bought a licensed module that had a DOC at the time you purchased it, right? Yeah. Isn't the manufacturer, like, responsible for telling you, hey, our DOC got pulled? Wouldn't the FAA expect that from yes. them? Yes, and they're supposed to keep contact information for you as well, like as a collection thing when you get a module. So they're supposed to be able to contact you for updates, changes, or pulls of the hardware. Yeah. Yet another thing that costs money. So so the question, Blunty, I think, and we're going to wrap this up because I know the chat hates it when we rant about remote ID for 40 minutes. We're not going to do that. But the question, I think, is whether you care about actually being compliant in a real sense or whether you just want to sort of tick the box and like be like, OK, screw it. Now I probably won't get in trouble. And frankly, if you just don't want to get in trouble, just ignore remote ID entirely because the chances of you getting in trouble for it are extremely small, no matter what you do. However, unless you're very visible, unless you're a part 107 or unless you have a YouTube channel, right? But if you want to buy some cheap module that maybe isn't compliant and be like, okay, I tick the box, I get that. The flight test uh, module is attempting to actually be fully compliant in a real sense. They're trying to follow the rules. And if you want a module that actually is following the rules to the letter, that's what it costs. So that's what I would say about that.